today, and um, I'm assuming, I'm, I, I don't know if you had time to post these today, they're not posted yet for those following online. They will be. They will be later, uh, you might even later in the sermon if you'd like, but uh, they will be posted shortly. Our lesson for today is, uh, is in your bulletin, and it's entitled, God Can Use Anybody, it's the very first part of the Miracle of Mercy. And so I want to start with this. Now, one of the things, before you do that, let me just tell you that the, uh, the, the handout is a little odd, and that's my fault. I never, I never put it in the right order and so forth. So page one is actually on the last page, but it, it's, it's titled, God Can Use Anybody. The second page is just to the right of it. The third and fourth page are on the back. So we all straightened out now. So hopefully you can follow along as best you can. So we are beginning this journey in season of Lent, looking at the miracle of God's mercy. And today's lesson, as I told you, is called God Can Use Anybody. It reminds me, when I was working on my master's degree, and I got my master's uh, degree, and we were all graduated, 150 of us from Luther Seminary, and we were there at a church for this big celebration. We all had our, our educational hoods, and we're walking up there and sat down, and before we received our diplomas and so forth, the guy who was preaching that day said something I will never forget. Don't remember the guy's name, can't remember his face, don't know who, he's, who he was, don't know why he was there, except he was there to give the commencement address. And he stood up and looked at us. He said, so we have 150 of you getting your master's degrees today, all of you going out and becoming pastors. Isn't that grand? He says, here's my comment to you all. You're not the best, but you're good enough. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's the way to go out from seminary, right? We all think that we're going to be great pastors, great preachers, the biggest this, the best that, and the truth is, none of us are. We're all just parish pastors. Some only lasted a couple of years. Some are still in the parish. Many are retired by now. I don't know. But here we are. We're doing the best with what we have. Now, that could be taken as a very discouraging thing, or it can be taken as an encouraging thing. Because I want it to be an encouraging thing. Because here's the truth about you. It is a sign of God's mercy today that no one is disqualified because of their past mistakes in life and that everyone is uniquely gifted for God's purposes to be God's mercy to the world that you may not be the best, but you are definitely good enough to be used by God. Today I want to read just a few excerpts from Paul's book to the Romans, which is one of the appointed lessons for the season of Lent. You can read the rest on your own. But it starts with this. When Adam sinned, sin entered into, Adam, sin entered into the world, and Adam's sin brought death, so that death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. But then you skip down to verse 15. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater still is God's grace, wonderful grace, and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. I love this passage because it reminds us of who we are and it reminds us of why we are the, on the receiving end of God's mercy. And why you are good enough just as you are. And I am telling you this to be true. I'm going to go over this in a hundred different ways, a hundred different angles, until you hear this today. You are good enough exactly as you are, exactly as you've been created. You are designed exactly as you're supposed to be. And you, right now, can be a mercy maker in this world. So this is what we learned from St. Paul about this topic of mercy and about who you are. The very first thing we learn of is that it's all because of God. The beginning of your life the ending of your life, everything in between, every day, every going in, every going out, begins and ends the same way with God blessing you, with the breath in your lungs and the opportunity for life. Ultimately, it's all about God, and all of it is a gift of God's mercy because of one reason, God just thinks you're awfully cute and adorable and loves you. Remember we said that a couple of weeks ago? You're God's puppy dogs. He just looks at you and says, oh, you melt his heart just takes one look at you and you melt God's heart. That's how precious you are. And so mercy is this. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. We don't earn it, we don't deserve it, but God gives it to us because we're God's kids. 
Those of you who have kids know what I'm talking about. You love your kids unreservedly. No matter what they do. They can do some really foolish things and you're like, okay, but I still love you, right? Because that's the way we love our kids. We just love them. That's the way God thinks about us. Everything God does in us, for us, by us, through us, because of his, is because of his mercy and grace, not because we've earned it or deserved it. And so we need to stop trying to earn it. Just stop it. Stop beating yourself up as though you haven't earned it enough or hasn't, don't deserve it enough. Just stop. You don't have to prove your worth to anybody. Now listen to what I'm saying here. You don't have to prove your worth to anybody. Is God in anybody? Is somebody, I should I say? Yeah. So you hear what I'm saying here and what I'm implying? You don't have to prove your worth to me. You don't have to prove your worth to anybody else. You don't have to prove your worth to God. You want to know why? Because God made you as you are, knows exactly who you are. You're as you are exactly supposed to be. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody, including God, because God just loves you as you flip an arm. Doesn't mean we don't prove in things. But God loves you right now. We don't have to wallow in our failures and feel badly about ourselves, as we just as I was saying just a few moments ago about Ash Wednesday and Lent. The purpose of Ash Wednesday and Lent is not for you in some masochistic way to beat yourself up about all your failures in life. You're doing Lent wrong. It's reminded how much God loves you. You should rejoice and give thanks. God has never used a perfect person in life in this world ever because there isn't one. They don't exist. And God's sure not going to start with you or me. But God's sure going to use us because we're just the way God made us. And that's number two, actually. Just be real with us. You know, a lot of people lie about who they are because they have this self-image they want to convey to everybody in the world. This is who I am. I'm such a great person. I'm such a this. I'm such a that. And we just act so much that sometimes we forget who we truly are. I mean, it's like preachers. I'll tell you what, preachers are really good about this. Uh, you know, when I, when I went to seminary, you could hear this. You could hear, I, I try. Now, I, I preach louder, and I get louder when I preach. But I hope you recognize that I'm the exact same person up here preaching as I am when I sit down with you guys. Outside of being louder and sometimes a little more animated to get my point across. But otherwise, I hope you can see the exact same person that you see when you sit down with me at a dinner. Or when I sit down with you after, after we, we speak. But here's the funny thing that happens to a lot of preachers when they, when they get up. They become a different person. And I'll tell you, this is very typical. The 150 kids in my, my graduating class and... You know, you'd sit up, sit up there, they'd be doing their sermon, and this is what happened. They'd be talking like this. Maybe they have a Pittsburgh accent. Hey, y'all, hey, you're going downtown to Pittsburgh. We're going downtown today. And all of a sudden, they get up to preach, and they'd say, By God, you are adored and loved <laughs> by Jesus. <laughs> or they'd do that Billy Graham thing. You know, the Bill, Billy Graham. Billy Graham, I can't even do my Billy Graham. My Billy Graham, <laughs> Jesus loves you. Okay, that's not a very he good really Billy Graham. Like that. that's, that's more like something else, you know. But all of a sudden, their voice change. They become this different crazy person. You're like, who the heck is this guy? He wasn't faking it, though. You know, that's right. Well, Billy Graham wasn't Billy Graham. was Billy Graham. He was being who he was supposed to be. Right. Okay? But a lot of preachers stop being themselves. We're hiding behind this image of who we are. You know, we got to be real. You have to see me up here preaching, but we got to be real in our lives and what we do. Because it can be really exhausting, can it, to be somebody that you aren't. You spend all your time lying to yourself and lying to everybody else. And just be authentic. Be genuine. Be yourself. God made you as your God knows everything about you. God knows exactly the way you are. Why are you trying to hide it? Just be who you're supposed to be. All right? God didn't create us to be somebody else. He created us to be you, and that's unique, and that's wonderful, and it's beautiful. And here's what happens. When you try to be somebody you're not, you're going to be under stress. You're going to fear that you're going to be exposed as a fraud. You're always living in fear of being exposed. And you end up manipulating people, don't you? You want it because you want to try to manipulate them to see you the way you see yourself or think of yourself. 
And it's, it's so exhausting. Just stop. You know, I had a kid. I have many kids in my track team. I've been coaching since 1985, okay? So I've, been, I've had a lot of kids I've coached in my time. Every year I got one kid at least like this who thinks he's the star athlete on the team. He thinks he's a 10.5 100-meter dash runner when the truth is he can only run 15 seconds in the 100. And you know what? I'm so ecstatic with 15-second 100-meter guys. I just love it. I love them. The ones that work hard and just do the best they can, and 15 seconds is what they're capable of doing, I'm, I'm so thrilled with that. But you know, this guy still thinks of himself as a 10.5 second 100 guy, and so what does he do? He gets into a race, and every race there's an excuse. Oh, my leg's hurting today. I can't run fast. Oh, well, you know, I didn't get much sleep last night. Oh, I didn't drink enough this. So every race there's an excuse why they're not running that 10.5. Outside of, I'm just not a very fast runner. Wouldn't they live a lot better if they admitted to themselves, I'm just a 15 second 100 guy, and it's okay. And you know what I do with 15 second 100 guys? They run a 14.9, and my kids will tell you this, I do a little jig and a dance. I get so excited. Chris, is that not true? Haven't you seen me a kid just improves this much, and they're terrible athletes in one sense, but they improve this much. I get so excited because they've improved. So all you have to do is be yourself, because that's all God wants you to do. Stop trying to be something you are not. Okay, number three, this kind of goes along with all this. It's all about God's God. If you want to be a merciful person, you need to understand God's mercy. It begins with God, it ends with God. You got to be real, and remember, it's not about me. Every time we forget that, every time we try to make it about me, we become bitter and we become prideful. Because we think, oh, I'm doing it all, I'm doing all the work. Nobody else is helping me. I'm to look at me. I'm the hardware. Everybody else, they just are not helping. And it's just, we just take this burden on ourselves and we just become bitter about that. We take everything then personally. We need to stop that. This is what you need to realize. Be happy with who you are. You're how God created you to be. Because if you don't think that much of yourself, you think, oh, I'm just not worth very much. I don't have very much to offer. Oh, God loves you, man, just the way you are. And I'm going to tell you what God does. Here's the great thing about God. God often puts his greatest gifts in what we perceive to be the weakest people. If you see somebody doing great things, I tell you what, usually it's, it's the rut. It's a kid that nobody accepted. It's a kid that doesn't think that they have much to offer. Those are the people God loves to use because when God does something, it's, you know, there's no doubt, man, God is really working. Because God can do some spectacular things. And that's where God's power shines because God, after all, does use flawed instruments. And so you just need to be embrace yourself. This is the way God made you. It's all good. Number four. This one kind of takes us in a little different direction, but it's true. If we're going to be people of mercy, we need to understand God's mercy. We need to understand this, that God uses my pain to help others. A little story with this. Most of you have heard me talk about this. Maybe some watching online are not aware of this. My dad was killed in October of 1969, two months before my seventh birthday. So now you can figure out. Everybody's thinking, how old is he now? Oh, my gosh. Okay. 92. 92. Right on. <laughs> I look good for 92. <laughs> All right. So anyway, October 19th. I saw the July. I sat on my dad's lap. I have such fond memories of this. I sat on my dad's lap and watched the moon launch in July of 1969. It made such an indelible impression on me and watch Neil Armstrong and so forth. And, and then we had October. My dad went out for a day to fly with his friend and didn't come back for dinner that night. And there were a whole bunch of people who were going to have a nice party that night. My grandmother was there and some family members. And then finally the news came to us that he was killed in, a car, in, a, in an airplane accident. Um, for those of you who have been through this, you know what this is like. And you sit there all of your life. Gosh, I wish my dad were there when I graduated from high school. 
Gosh, I wish my dad were there when I got married. Gosh, I wish my dad were there when my daughter was born. Gosh, I wish my dad were here just to talk to because I'm ready to go crazy. Right? We all do that. Even if they die later in life, we still wish they were here. But here's the thing. There were times that I went through in my life where I said, God, how could you have done this to me? That's normal too, isn't it? Right? Why did you do this? This person was taken from me before I was expecting them to. And we blame God sometimes. But this is one of the things that I learned about death. God did not kill my dad. Now, I will tell you, there are a lot of people who will disagree with that when they come up to you in a funeral home. They say some of the dumbest stuff. I was going to use some other language there. Because it really ticks me off what people say at funeral homes. You know, honey, God must have needed your dad more than you. Bull crap. You're saying God needs my dad more than a seven-year-old boy needs his dad? Are you stupid? Is God that cruel? Really? No, God isn't that cruel. Life is that cruel. Mm -hmm. My dad, mm -hmm. I finally realized, you know why he was killed? because the airplane crashed. It's called a thing called gravity. And I could explain to you exactly how that worked in my dad's case because he had his friend flying the plane and his friend didn't know the, the ins and outs of that airplane. And so his friend crashed the plane, killed my dad. Yeah, it ticks me off sometimes. But it wasn't God that killed my dad. But I will tell you this, this is what God did do for me. In this tragedy, God walked with me in my times of pain and blessed me with his Holy Spirit. That is an amazing thing. My dad was going to die anyway. I mean, he's going to die. It happened. It's one day or another. But God sustained me. Why? Because God loves me. And then the amazing thing is God takes my pain and makes it possible for me to minister to others. I can't tell you how many little boys I've been able to sit with and just talk with when they sit there and lost a parent. And I can relate and understand because I can use my pain to help them. See, this is what God does. If Paul, in the Bible, in our lesson for today, well, no, he doesn't mention this in the lesson today, but he does at some other points, he mentions about his thorn in the flesh that he had. We don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, but God never took it away. But what he does say is it created his dependency upon God rather than himself, and so God then used that to be a blessing for people. And same thing for me. My pain, my heartache is not a wasted opportunity. It is an opportunity to connect with other people and be a blessing to them. I promise you this, you will have very rocky roads ahead of you. As painful as some of your past has been, I promise every single one of you here, you probably have not had your worst day of your life yet. Just haven't. And that's a really tragic thing to say. It's still a come. Some of you might have. But here's the thing. I do promise you this, the Spirit will be with you in that time of grief heartache. And God will not waste that opportunity. You will be able to use that to be a blessing to other people who are going through some difficult challenges themselves. That's four. Five. If we're going to go through a rocky road in life, if things are going to be difficult and challenging for us, we need to realize that we need to now for, therefore stay focused on what's truly important on eternity. Because here's the problem with this life. We think of this life, our life is this, this long, no matter how long it is. Eternity is much bigger. God's got a bigger plan for us. Immeasurable. Immeasurably. So I can tell you this. Most men in particular think this way. I think some women do too. But statistically, men think this way a little bit more. They get to the end of their life and they think, I just didn't accomplish anything I want to. My life has been a disappointment. I should have done more. Guys tend to think that way. We need to stop thinking that way. Just be faithful today with the moments that you have, and you get to the end of your life, then you've done what you're supposed to do. No, you might not have cured cancer like you dreamed you could have. 
You might not have done all the things you'd hoped to do. Well, none of us are going to accomplish everything in life. We just won't. You're going to get to the end of your life with things that you wish you'd done that you just didn't. Rather than regretting them, recognize the fact that there's more life than this. I'm going to have more opportunities to grow. And that's really cool. So we have to have an eternal perspective. We are to maintain that eternal perspective on life. Otherwise, we lose perspective when we become weary and discouraged. Because that's what happens. Sometimes you walk around with these blinders on. You just think this is all there is. And you're like, oh, my life is crazy. And this is all there is? Is this? No, we've got to look up. Take those blinders up and look up. And recognize that there's more to life than what you got going on. There's more to life than the accomplishments you've done in your life. There's more to life than curing cancer. Even if you are the person that cures cancer, so what? I mean, good for you. Yay, you. You're still going to get to the end of your life thinking, gosh, I wish I could have done more. Look up. Get a grip. Get an eternal perspective on life. We need to look past our problems and look to the reward that's awaiting us. That's what Jesus did last week. You remember when we looked at the Transfiguration Sunday last week? So we read that lesson every year, the Transfiguration of our Lord. And what Jesus needed to do is he got up on top of the mountain. He was ministered to by Moses and Elijah. And he caught a glimpse, certainly saw the cross coming. The cross was right here. This is what Jesus was. Jesus was walking to the cross. The Bible actually says that. He's walking to the cross. He's got blinders on. All he can see is the cross. And he's saying, is this going to be even worthwhile? Why am I doing this? Why do I have to go through this pain? Getting up to the mountaintop, he was able to take the blinders off, look up, and look across the other side and see that there was something else beyond the cross. That was really helpful. Gave him courage to be able to face the cross. So I'm encouraging you, when you feel like you've got blinders on, you feel like you're, you're just being drowned by the cares of life. What you need to do is take those blinders off and look up and recognize that God has bigger plans for you. The heartaches that you're going through right now, it's just this long, that's it. It's painful now because we don't have that eternal perspective. But God promises to give us courage so that we might endure the crosses of this life. I want to end with this. You remember the name Corey Ten Boom? I have this yes. name listed down here. She was an amazing lady. She didn't think she was a, an amazing lady. In fact, she wrote a book. She, she did it. She didn't and came to grips with this. But she wrote a book entitled The Tr Tramp for the Lord because she thought of herself as a tramp. You know, it's a very pejorative, negative type of thing. She was just, she, she was uh, not worthy, unworthy of any recognition, acknowledgement in life, and yet she was one of the great women of faith in the 20th century. But a little bit about her family. Her family in World War II, Nazi Germany, smuggled Jews out of the country and hid Jews in their house. And her sister, she, by her, her own mission, I don't remember her sister's name now, and I apologize, but uh, her sister, she said, was such a saintly, goodly, kindly, godly woman. And she said, I resented the Jews being in her house. She said, I hated them being there. They put her life at risk, and sure enough, they were all arrested and thrown into prison camps. Her parents died. Her sister, the godly woman, who was the one protecting all these Jews, died in her arms. And she was the only one left. Of all the people, she said, that God could have spared. Her parents were goodly, kindly, godly people. Her sister was a goodly, kindly, godly person. The only person in her family who survived was the tramp. The worst one. But God let her survive. And she worried, she doubted, she was frustrated until finally she realized something. And this is what this quote is all about. Why God spared her. And then at the end of life, she wrote these words. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. So you can worry about how you fall short. You can worry about how you're not good enough, how you're not this, you're not that, or how you've accomplished all the things in life. You can regret these things, and you can spend all your life, and all this is going to do is steal the joy from your life today. Or you can look up and gain an eternal perspective on the mercy that God has for you. Why? Because you're God's little puppy dog. He just melts when he sees you.
He just sees that little tail, tail of yours wagging. He says, okay, that's my kid. Just accept it. He loves you. He adores you. Get an eternal perspective on life so that you no longer have to wallow in all the sorrows and all the heartaches. You'll still go through the heartaches and sorrows, but you have the perspective of how precious you are in God's sight. Let us pray. See, God, I believe that you can use every single person here in a miraculous and spectacular way, but we're holding on to too much baggage. The pretension of what we think we should be, or are, but really are not. The thought that we're somehow better than what we are. Maybe some of us are thinking the opposite way. We just think we're just worthless. Well, you know what? We're not the best, God. None of us are. But by gum, we're all good enough. You've chosen us. You adore us. You love us as a parent loves their child. And because you've had mercy on us, we can have a bigger perspective of life, that life is bigger than this. And as a result, we can live our lives in a merciful fashion. We are so grateful. For it is in Jesus' name we thank you, thank you and pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to receive the Lord's blessing this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord look his countenance upon you and give you his favor and peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let's go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a wonderful week.